Hi, I'm Danielle Dufo, and you're watching Paleologic. Today, I'm going to be reacting to some old timey paleo art. Let's go. Oh, I love this piece so much. I mean, it's clearly not the most technically impressive piece of art you've ever seen, but it's actually amazingly forward thinking. This was one of the two first sketches ever done of Pterodactylus. It was done in 1800 by Jean Herman for Georges Cuvier, who was publishing on this specimen. At the time, we definitely weren't as far along in terms of knowledge on taxonomy and the relationship of animals through time. And we had no idea where animals like this and pterosaurs in general would belong. This artist who was trying to make sense of what the fossil looked like, he saw features that reminded him of mammals and features that reminded him of birds. So he decided to give it wing membranes and fur. And even as you can see, there's mammalian genitalia on there and little tail and cute little cat ears for some reason. We didn't know any better. You know, this was the best guess we could make. But what's really cool is that we didn't even have any fossil evidence back then of wing membranes or proto feathers. So that that like furry covering that pterosaurs do now have. Like we have fossil evidence now that they had these things and we had no idea back then. So he was kind of peering into the future of the knowledge around pterosaurs. Pretty cool. I don't think that they had any idea of how those, those wing bones really went together. If he was trying to infer that this is something between a bird and, and a mammal, he might have been seeing more mammalian features. So he probably went with what he knew, which would be flying squirrels and just scratched that skin. <laughs> that beak looks very birdy though. Come on, flying bird squirrel. I love it so much. <laughs> like I said, not the most impressive piece of art, but pretty forward thinking. <laughs> okay, I love Possum Dactylus. He's beautiful. Technically, I'd say the art is a huge step up, but also, what the heck? So it's 1843 and Edward Newman is illustrating for natural history books and they've got the presses running. It's 43 years after the publication of Pterodactylus and we still have no idea what they are. This illustration was made 16 years before Darwin's origin of the species. So we really didn't have the concept of taxonomy and evolution. At this point, they were really just finding fossils and kind of jamming them in wherever they thought it might fit. We landed on marsupials, folks. <laughs> the idea of them being a transitional mammal bird is still floating around. And the idea that marsupials might fit in there somewhere comes from the idea that birds lay eggs and marsupials look like mammals. Again, at this point, we still didn't know that pterosaurs were in fact fuzzy. We have fossils these days with preserved proto feathers on them. So he nailed that. Can't say he necessarily nailed the, the adorable ears and the mammalian snout. Also, you can tell that they started thinking about how they were flying with these, these wing structures. At least this one's not flapping with one gigantic blanket between his legs. The weird thing about this though is that the guys flying around in the background look a lot more like the typical reconstruction that you might expect of a pterosaur these days. So like maybe if you just squint at them, they become more realistic. Mm -hmm. All right, I really do love this one. Technically pretty weird looking, but the history that's recorded here is way more impressive than the art itself, I think. This was done in 1800 by Robin Boltunov, who joined an expedition to help dig up the first mammoth in permafrost. This was the first mummified mammoth. The whole reason it looks the way it does is because he was trying to document exactly what he saw that remained on this mummy. So this was actually a mummy of a mammoth, not just an attempt at reconstructing a mammoth from bones, but actually showing what was there and preserved. So I guess it was lacking its ears, so he gave him some cute little teddy bear ears on top there. Not sure what those are about. <laughs> Probably just bone protruding out of rotting flesh, mummified flesh. I find one of the most perplexing things here is what the heck is going on with those tusks? This could be one of two things. Either the tusks were displaced 
and he decided to try and draw them back on the face in some manner or form. Or because it was really hard to try and draw these tusks that were curling away in opposite directions from the face. And so when you're showing it from the side, maybe you kind of cut a few corners with perspective. <laughs> you do see a lot of features on here that look properly elephantine, but there's a lot of things on here that also indicate this creature was just not in perfect condition and he was just representing it as it was. One of my favorite things about it is that he actually bothered to draw on some of the reddish brown hair that remained on the mummy. You can see that he's got some reddish brown pen marks all over its face and that's probably where the hair was preserved. It's a pretty cool feature. Ah, oh, yes. Okay, so this is some classic dinosaur paleo art. This was made in 1865 by an artist named Edouard Ryu. Here we have featured Megalosaurus and Iguanodon. This whole style has persisted throughout the 1800s, mostly for the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. At the time, we really didn't have very much fossil evidence for either of them, but they decided to do their best putting them together. You can see here Megalosaurus, which today we know is a bipedal theropod with small arms, was on all fours like a lizard with, you know, big lumbering limbs because the best thing that they could compare that to was probably something like a monitor lizard. So they scaled that up to the bones that they had and made their best guess. I'd say my favorite out of the two is probably Iguanodon. He definitely looks a little more lizard-like than Megalosaurus here. And one of the reasons for that is because of that weird little horn that they seem to like putting on his head. But this spike originates from the thumb spike of Iguanodon, which was found isolated but associated with a skeleton. But nobody knew where these big spikes belonged. So they made their best guess and said, all right, stick it on his nose. I think it makes him look pretty cool, personally, but probably more functional where it belongs, right here on Iguanodon. You can still visit life-size models of these dinosaurs in 3D reconstructions from the Crystal Palace in Britain. Pretty cool. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful ink work. It's descriptive and it's creepy as heck. <laughs> So naturally, I love it. I find like the art style here is simple, but it's so effective at just communicating what's there. These kinds of deep sea fish monsters, most of them are black in pigment, so all they really need is black ink. It wasn't for a long time before we started to be able to dredge up creatures such as this lantern fish for the sake of photography or illustration. Can you imagine being one of the first artists to try and describe a lantern fish? Because these creatures look more like demons than animals, let's be honest. Now, this art was done in 1926, and the only way to get creatures like this up from the deep sea was to dredge them up by some means. The problem with catching animals from so deep in the ocean is that their bodies are held together by the pressure from down below. So as they rise up to the top, their bodies basically start to decompress and they look a little bit messed up. So what the artist got to see wasn't really the natural shape of the animal itself in life. This would have been a representation of what the animal's remains looked like after it went through that horrible decompression. This was probably a bit of a harrowing experience for the artist. He nailed it. Looks like an absolute nightmare. <laughs> Ooh, the tiger cat. At least, I'm pretty sure it's a cat. <laughs> Judging by the body, you know, a cat's a cat's a cat's a cat. But that face is definitely something else. Cats, especially wild small cats, are extremely fleeting sights. You're lucky enough to see one at all, and if you do, it's probably only for a couple seconds. Back in the time, we didn't have technology to record video of something and then go back to it. As an artist, you either had to hope to see it yourself, or you would depend on the description of somebody else who had seen it. So in this case, I have a feeling that he was drawing a cat and added some spots, and maybe lost the reference for the face? <laughs> There's something about this cat face versus the rest of its body. Wait, no, no, I think I got it. I think I have this figured out. This was probably a stuffed cat. And the taxidermist was not the best. It's got like big bulging glassy eyes and that face is just not right. The body is actually really good. Maybe a little stiff. 
you know one cat face, you kind of know what a cat looks like. Somebody hasn't seen a cat for a bit and relied too heavily on some bad taxidermy. That's my take. It's my guess. He's so cute. <laughs> All right, this is Alexander Karpinski's interpretation of where the tooth whorl would be placed on the face of Helicoprion. 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 This was, at the time, as good of a guess as any. A lot of early sharks had weird structures that could be placed almost randomly anywhere on their bodies. This here is clearly the most mysterious of shark structures though. We've gone through just about every single possible iteration of how this tooth whorl could fit on its face, from the upper jaws to the lower jaws, from pointing outwards into the water to being inside of its mouth. The problem with Helicoprion is that the only thing that's ever been preserved from it is the tooth whorl itself. Teeth are extremely hard, the enamel that they're made of doesn't break down very easily. That's why we end up having teeth in the fossil record for sharks more than anything else. They don't have bones, remember that. The only bony thing in their body is their teeth. The rest of their skeleton is cartilage, so it just doesn't have that same chance to fossilize. It would take some very special circumstances to find more than just the tooth whorl of a helicoprion. So I think this was an adorable and perfectly good attempt at reconstructing the shark. The fact that he put it together that it was a shark is impressive enough. <laughs> oh, this is a beautiful painting. We've got Mosasaurus and a couple of Ichthyosaurs. Our understanding of both these animals has definitely evolved. We know much more about their physiology than we did at the time, but these are really beautiful. I'd say that the Ichthyosaurus still look pretty valid in terms of our understanding of what their bodies look like. It's got the gigantic eyes and the small stout bodies. The tails on them have definitely changed from what we understand and didn't have just like the single fin lobe. But what's interesting is that that kind of tail, if you put that on the Mosasaur, would have been more accurate for the Mosasaur. I guess at the time we didn't have full Mosasaurus body fossils. We know now that they didn't have eel-like bodies, but really these are wonderful illustrations. What I love so much about this old paleo art, it's not really so much to laugh about, you know, how wrong they were or anything, because all of these are just snapshots of what our understanding of you know, life history was at the time. And what we know today and what we think is good paleo art now is probably gonna be laughed at in another 50 years. Mark my words, by all means, laugh at mine. <laughs> okay, this is really cool. This is from 1908, and this is supposed to be a painting of a Mosasaur. 30 years after this is when that famous photo of Nessie was taken, or what we call Nessie. I'd be willing to believe that it's the same myth of a sea monster or a sea serpent that inspired the art here, as well as the public adoration of Nessie. I mean, Mosasaurus could have been Nessie, who knows? The art itself is really technically beautiful as well. The kind of sinuous motion that this sea serpent mosasaur is going through is really cool. And that fluidity of all the waves, that translucency where you can see through the water. It looks like real water and waves to me. It's, it's beautiful. Even though it's not, you know, technically accurate for how we understand mosasaurus, it's a very evocative piece of art. I love it. <laughs> What is this? Okay, this is very old paleo art. I believe it's 1604. My goodness, it's hard to say what I'm looking at, but my best guess is that this is a rotting whale carcass. Even today, people have a really hard time understanding what a rotting whale looks like. And a lot of people might assume that, you know, a washed up carcass is some kind of mysterious creature because whales look very different on the inside than they do on the outside. You can see by that hand flipper thing, that is what a whale flipper looks like on the inside. Whales technically still have hands on the inside of that flipper, they just have some very effective fleshy gloves. Also, if I had to guess what kind of rotting whale carcass this is, I would probably say an orca. Based on those teeth that you see there, it looks very similar in structure to orca teeth. And there's only a couple of toothed whales that look anything like this. You can even see like the way that the skin is draped across the ribs and everything. Oof, that's pretty gnarly. 
Yeah, you could say that this is a monster, but I'm pretty darn sure that this is just a rotting whale. <laughs> I love this guy. This gets a 10 out of 10 for me. This is Dinotherium, and I've got no notes. He's perfect. He's also extremely angry. What did you do to this poor Dinotherium to make him so angry? In terms of anatomy, I would say he's he looks exactly the way that I would imagine Dinotherium. I drew one that looked pretty close to this, except mine was in less of a terrible mood. The assumption that Dinotherium had a shorter trunk than modern day elephants is also well reflected here. I would say just about everything about this piece of art is good anatomy, it's beautiful background, the pen and ink technique is forever beautiful. Dinotherium, 10 out of 10, A+. Would rate again. I kind of want to start a metal band and use this as like my album art, because it's so angry. I can hear him raging from his trunk. Anyway, go on. Let's keep going. Ooh, he's so lovely. Just like a sweet little guy. Look at those big bright eyes. This was painted by George Edwards in the 1700s. He is an extremely prolific artist and is currently known as the father of British ornithology. He ended up doing all kinds of creature illustrations for birds and animals that would later end up in the Gutenberg press and popularized in all kinds of media and educational books and guides on nature. So he spent his life making beautiful art like this and charming people by giving them really cute features like these big beautiful bright eyes. Just about every reference book that you have today that is about animals or birds is still kind of using the same style. It's pretty pretty consistent. And he's just such a cute little guy. This was really cool because I feel like I got a little bit of a history lesson, not just seeing a bunch of fun old paleo art, but also understanding what we knew at the time. And it turns out we were missing a lot of pretty important information back then in terms of taxonomy and evolution. It also makes me wonder how much more we're gonna learn in the future. How wrong are we right now? Stick around to find out. <laughs> So what should we talk about next? And what do you want me to see next? Let me know in the comments and make sure to subscribe for new episodes every week. Thanks for watching. See you later and stay curious.